Welcome to the Going to Seed podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Darren Abbey, a prolific plant experimenter from the US who is here to tell us all about the amazing projects that he's been working on. So to get us started, Darren, can you tell us a bit about your background? My background is long and involved, but as far as it relates to this topic, my family always had gardens when I was growing up. And so I pretty early on developed a compulsion to save seeds even from things that I will never grow. <laughs> I just have a large seed collection that's just things that I like looking at them every now and again. Eventually, I got into high, into high school and, and college where I got a degree in biology. After that, after, well, after a few years working on, on outside jobs, I went back to school to get a graduate degree, uh, a PhD from the Department of Genetics at the University of Minnesota. My work there was primarily in yeast genetics and yeast bioinformatics. So not exactly related to what we're going to be talking about, but there's some crossover in my, in my own way. And at some point in grad school, I finally had some space of my own where I could have some garden efforts of my own. And that has been a developing thing since. In my day job, I work as a clinical toxicologist. I'm one of the people involved in the process of taking handling or processing or whatever your urine drug test results before you get employed or for other uses uh, in the medical context. In that job, I don't get to play with genetics. Uh, and so I started more actively focusing on plant breeding because I could explore genetics in my garden in a way that the day job and grad school at that interval wasn't providing for me. And that kind of got me to where I am now. Some of my plant breeding projects I've been running for about 10 years. Some are much newer. And I like to think I've got interesting results from almost all of them, at least the ones I think about. I would highly recommend people check out your blog. You have detailed and really insightful accounts into the different projects that you've worked on over the years and new, new projects that you're starting as well too. I've, I've found your approach it's at the more technical end of the spectrum of plant breeders, but it's good to see that there's that range in the community. And who knows, there might be someone out there with less of a technical background who is running into genetic problems. Maybe they could send you an email one day and say, what's going on here? <laughs> I'm always open to having conversations, but one of the key things for any listeners to, to note is that there is so much we do not know about the plants that we live around and that we use and we grow. And so any research that you may come across that's talking about the specific gene or pathway, that's just a very limited view. There's, and if, if you just rely on that information to guide your plant breeding, you will have a very limited project because there's so much that you can do that we just don't know that level. I, this actually gets me to a question I wanted to ask, but I'll get it out of the way early. <laughs> um, do you see having a a highly technical knowledge of genetics and plant breeding to be a double-edged sword, that people who know too much will sometimes assume that it's not worth trying some simple experiment because they think it's not going to lead anywhere, whereas a person with no technical training, like Luther Burbank, would right. do all sorts of crazy crosses that yes. an expert would uh, say, you're wasting your time. Absolutely. Luther Burbank has been inspirational to me in some ways from some of my projects, but we'll talk further about my blue colored dry beans. Yes. Um, that was a project where I started from uh, a whim or a vibe that, hey, this should be possible. And then over time developed a more technical grasp of the molecular biology behind it based off of all this research that I can delve into from my background. Mm -hmm. Talking with some professional academic bean breeders, they were like, well, we weren't certain that that would be possible, but you just went and did it. I'm like, yep, there you go. <laughs> and since I've learned more about this blue anthocyanin pigment pathway in these beans from all this research, I've started to look in other plants and, you know, expand my interest a little bit. And sometimes I find surprising things. I've been breeding carrots for a few years. The biennial crop takes two years to go from seed to seed. And so it's a more involved process than a lot of things. And one of my carrots in the last generation that was in my discard pile. It was too small. I wasn't going to go forward with it. But once I got to the process of, of shaving and cleaning it and cutting it in half, I realized it was white with blue streaks. And 
I had just come across a paper from, you know, a few months before where a research group had determined through genetic analysis that carrots do not have the enzyme necessary to produce this blue pigment. So just it kind of highlights how research is research. It doesn't tell us everything. And even if the research was absolutely correct for the variety of carrots they were using, it doesn't necessarily apply to all of them. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I am looking forward to this next generation of seeds in that project. I don't have seeds from that one plant, but I have seeds from siblings. And so I'm hoping I can recover that combination of traits again. <laughs> It'll pop up again. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So to, Now to that I know us, it's possible. <laughs> so to give us an idea of what you're working with for your personal resources in plant breeding. Can you tell us a bit about the space and the soil, the temperatures, sure. how you handle um, fertility and water and weeds? Like just how do you manage your growing space and, and what are you working with? All right. I have two gardens. One is about 30 feet by 12 feet. It's at my lo local community garden. Um, I have another garden in my backyard, which is a bit smaller than that one, although I did expand it in the last year. Uh, but so it is very small scale growing, especially for the large number of projects I tend to do. The soil between the two different conditions and the lighting and sunlight hours differs quite a bit between the two. My personal yard is a sandy hill. And so the soil is very sandy, doesn't hold water very well. I've amended it with compost and I do that every, every few years from either compost I produce here or I have a, a big dump load of it from, from my local garden center. And so, you know, to improve the organic content and helpfully improve the water retention of the soil. The garden at the community garden, that is a plot that has been grown for many years by people since the community garden was founded and the soil was not well maintained. So I've been trying to improve it over the few years I've been working with it so far. That soil isn't sandy so much as a fine silt without a lot of organic matter. So when it gets dry, it gets very hard almost like concrete feeling sometimes. I'm trying to amend that and improve that over time. Uh, so the, yeah, the plants have very different soils depending on where I've got them. Um, half of that community garden plot, the soil is much better than the other half. And you know, if I grow tomatoes on one side, they taste much better than if they grow on the other, um, <laughs> things like that. I um, do not use herbicides or insecticides. I'm going, the concept I'm going with is a very minimal input. And that is in part because I'm, I'm lazy I don't want to spend money. And three, I don't want to accidentally breed up a variety of plants that requires those inputs. And so minimal inputs, compost, water, that's about it. Brilliant. And it's amazing that you've done so much work in such a small space. I think that's really inspiring. It is. I didn't really think about it, but whenever someone who's interested in plant breeding hears about the space I'm working with, they're like, oh, wow. Like, oh, okay, maybe this is a small space. <laughs> It's the do, largest garden I've ever had, but it's a small space. Now, do you have surplus seeds from your crosses that you have no space to plant? Like Always. I'm, I'm um, just thinking that might be a potential resource that you could distribute through places like the Experimental Farm Network. That is that is an organization I appreciate. And, you know, that is something that I may come to in the future. Um, yeah. at, at this point, I've got a few varieties that I think are worth potential development in some way towards towards a, a way that they can be distributed in some form or other i have yeah. not worked out the details yeah i mean it's, finding other growers to go sifting through the high variability f2 f3 populations to look for the winners it's a it's a very different concept for seed sales most mm. seed varieties that you see it's stabilized at eight generations or more perfectly consistent and a lot of the seeds i have would be hey here's a crazy mess. Good luck. <laughs> but, you know, as it has become a more acceptable way to, to grow plants in recent years, and I know you've had several guests on this podcast discussing traditions more along those lines. Well, the, the uniformity drive is very much side effect of industrial agriculture, that you want Absolutely. everything to harvest on the same day and be perfectly uniform, that the machines don't get clogged on it. And for home gardeners, we just get the cast offs from that system in the seed supply yes. usually. And they're not yeah. really very good for home growth usually. I mean, some are okay, but some are terrible. And yes. these, <laughs> these high variability grexes, these, these unstable populations are often the best thing for home growers because it, it, it's a, well, it saves you the difficult work of doing that early mixing. And you've got a population that you can start selecting from. And it's so variable that it won't become inbred too quickly, depending on the species. Right. So yeah, there's there's a 
a lot of benefits in this approach if if you're prepared for you know the occasional thing to look a bit strange <laughs> and you know what if a tomato looks strange or it's the wrong color the wrong shape it's still a tomato yeah yeah i very rarely had a tomato where i bit into it and it spit it out <laughs> i have had those every now and again but very rarely um, <laughs> so you mentioned color and pest resistance what are your other priorities in crop breeding one of the areas that i find very interesting is in making miniature varieties the first place I had of my own to actually grow anything, it was in a balcony railing planter in an apartment building. So I had a, like one foot by two or three feet, and that was where I could, could some grow some stuff. And I found a miniature tomato somewhere, and I grew it there, and I was so pleased with myself. And so I started working to make other varieties of miniature tomatoes, and then extended that to other plants like peppers and corn. They can still be grown in a garden in a garden bed, and that's where I generally grow them, but they do take more effort to deal with weeds growing around them because if your plant is eight inches tall, well, it'll get grown over pretty quick if you don't keep on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, I, I, I love those cute little plants, but in my climate where things grow at a rate of knots, and like the only way you can do anything on scale is if the crop gets taller than the weeds, yeah, it's it's a very different uh, mindset for things, but I, I love looking at the photos of them. They're so cute. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I have one of my miniature peppers that I potted up from the garden season. So it's on a shelf right now with, under, under some lights. And I'm just so tickled tickled with it every time I walk by and see it, see it blooming in the nice pretty leaves. And it's only three inches tall. <laughs> okay, so now let's get into the, the detail. So we'll try and focus on one of your crop breeding projects at a time and tell me everything about it, like what species it is, what goals you're working towards for that particular species, how you source the original material, and do you do hand pollination or open crossing and your selection strategy, like just run through the one at a time. So this is the this okay. part I was really um, looking forward to. I will give a general statement before I go into any details of a specific species. My general strategy for crossing is I'm not going to spend the time to do manual crosses. Ever or just? Ever. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I've had very good success. If I want to cross two varieties of the eggplant or two varieties of the tomato, I will grow the plants right next to each other, yeah. tangled up in each other, and let the bees deal with it. Um, do you have a good bumblebee population, I'm guessing? I have I have good bumblebees in my yard. In the community garden has a, a European honeybee colony nearby. And so there's a lot of pollinator activity that I can, I can rely on for this. This strategy only really works if the two varieties have some trait that is visible in the early seedling stage so that I can identify the hybrids at an early stage. So if I have a, a tomato that has extra fuzzy leaves, which is a recessive trait, and then another tomato which has normal leaves, and I save the seeds from the fuzzy plant only, any hybrids will jump out and then mm. I can just plant those. And so I don't have to grow a hundred plants to fruition to find out what they are. I can grow a hundred seedlings and move forward from there. Not every pairing works out this way because sometimes you don't have a, a recessive that you, in one parent that you can see early on in the other, but I've had pretty good luck with it so far. Even just if it's a, just subtle. A, I've, I've just had a brainwave because <laughs> I've, I've got the similar problem coming up for me. Do you reckon there's a chance that the volatiles could be identified from two different parents? This and is definitely a something seedling. You could maybe smell a leaf if you trained your senses on the parents. I, I believe you absolutely could in a technical way. Yeah. Uh, if you took a, a leaf sample and put it through HPLC for look for the met metabolomics, I'm absolutely certain you could identify hybrids that way. Yeah. And if you are part of a big breeding program at a institutional level, that would be a very good way to uh, reduce the number of plants you have to grow out. But as a home grower, I wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to have a, a sommelier's refined snoot. <laughs> and tomatoes do have this sort of aromaticness. And so you could find varieties that had a difference in that. And you could you know, use that as a marker. Uh, yeah. It's just not something I have found all that helpful for me. Yeah. Um, I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm dealing with my okay. own problems here with lima bean pollination. <laughs> so I'll, I'll speed the details, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Okay. It's fascinating. Anyway. And so, uh, and so, and so yeah, this, this approach has worked for all the species that I've tried to apply it for. It does have, a, it does have consequences though, in that if you absolutely need to have a hybrid to grow next year, you may not get it. It's a stochastic process, a random process. And if I were in a plant breeding graduate program or was a great using having 
uh, a program that was funded by some grants that had a timeline, just doing this bee pollination method would not work. I would need to do a more manual intervention to ensure the timeline worked forward. But since I don't need to have that timeline, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So now, what crops? You mentioned beans before, Fasciolus vulgaris, the common mm -hmm. bean. I started with that one because one day I was walking around and it occurred to me that the pigment family that's responsible for the red color in beans also has blue in some, some plants. Mm -hmm. And that led to, well, maybe I can have a blue bean. And then I started looking into it and I found basically nothing. When I looked in seed collections and talked to bean collectors and whatnot, eventually I did come across a variety being sold from Europe. I, it's now known as San Bernardino Blue, I think. It's an Italian variety that got introduced over here. But when I tried to source those seeds, they were out of stock or the company had folded or it, it, was, it just felt like a mirage for a few years. And eventually I decided I was just going to have to try to make my own because why not? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's worth pointing out too, that if you look on eBay, there's a lot of disreputable sellers with Photoshop. Yes. And you've, you've and... had some articles about that, which were, yes. yeah, for, for people starting out, it can be uh, a bit disappointing. So buyer beware. Until, yes. Until you know what's, what the range of real possibilities, it can be very easy to be taken in by some of the uh, less scrupulous sellers. Uh, eventually, I was chatting with a, a bean collector who is otherwise more known for their science fiction writing. Uh, I didn't know that at the time they were just a bean collector I'd run into. And I'm not going to drop names and divert the conversation here. I asked them if they had ever seen a blue bean. And they were like, you know, I haven't. But I do have these random hybrids that turned up in my garden last year that have a little bit of blue color. So they sent me three seeds, three individual seeds that were black with this hint of blue just like the on the reflection they look blue and i was like sure whatever i'll, I'll get it to go and i planted three plants and i got or three seeds i got three plants and one of them had this nice lovely dark blue and that was the start of the actual progress on that here's my cat who's been staring at me um <laughs> so at that at that point in the project i had no idea the origin of the cross. I had no idea of the genetics or anything about the biology. It was just, I had the idea that it should be possible. And then I started looking. Over a few years, I had that stabilized into a better color and you know, more, sta more stable color. The color of the beans is, at this point, I have confirmed that when the beans are in stores, they don't darken to a brown, which mm -hmm. is a fault of the San Bernardino blue beans, as far as I've been able to tell. Mm -hmm. There's a few other bluish beans around that they tend to be more gray or they have blue in the name, but they tend to be gray or they tend to be purple by my eye or that they darken to a brown in storage. And so when, if you buy them from a vendor, the package has this pretty color on the seeds, but then they, they turn up and they're not that color. Mm -hmm. And the ones I have over this sort of random selection process I, de process I developed, they are very stable in color. And so even seeds that are several years old now keep the color and have not color shifted, which is something I find very nice. I have, because I have a sort of a scientific technical interest as well, I, along the way, I was doing a lot of research into you know, what's known about the biology color in this and related species. And at some point, I felt I had developed a sufficient model or understanding of what led to the color uh, that I decided to try to replicate it in some other species. And so I set about finding seeds that would be useful for making a blue lima bean, a blue runner bean, blue tepary bean. And this last year was the first year I grew any of that germplasm and some things worked out and some things didn't and the, the project moves forward. How I found those seeds, some was, some was from eBay, some was from more established vendors. Some of the runner bean seeds I got from a a lot of seeds that were sold for food purposes. Uh, and I just took out some seeds and grew them. Those didn't work so well because they were adapted for an entirely different time zone to climate photo period. There's the word I was looking for. And so they didn't really prosper up here. And I had a, a wonderful trellis of runner beans with all the pretty flowers. And I got four seeds that are maybe mature enough to grow out of that. <laughs> it's actually a big part of the fun I find is going on the hunt for the genetics that you would need for a particular project. It is interesting. eBay can be difficult for that 
you know, you mentioned the potential for fraudulent seed sales on the air, but there's also, if you're not paying attention, you might not exactly know where the seeds are coming from. I found some lima beans had a nice purple color that I thought would have the right genetics for what I'm looking for. And I ordered them and they, a few weeks later, I was like, huh, they haven't turned up yet. I wonder, I better check on that. And where apparently they had been ordered from was Sri Lanka. Oh. And so, yeah, those wouldn't grow in my climate very well. <laughs> So that didn't work out, but I did find a purple lima that's actually from here in the United States, from South Carolina, which is much closer for a, the photo period versus a tropical Ecuador climate <laughs> source. So I'm hoping that those grow well this year. And again, to set up a cross in this species, I just grow them on the same trellis yeah. And, yeah. and go from there. And that lets me pack in more plants and more in limited space. But it also, of course, leads to the chaos of I don't know whatever I will get. But I just sort it out at the end and figure it out later. Do, do you find that approach helps and it gives you a reason to do less labeling? Like, uh, yes. you, you know what it's like with real research. <laughs> you can spend half your time just labeling all of the samples and it gets yes. more and more complicated as you go. And uh, there's it, very little labeling I do. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Most successful plant breeders I've seen, amateur plant breeders, learn to get by with relatively minimal amounts of labeling yeah you can spend a lot of there's a lot of these things that you can spend a lot of time and effort doing like the labeling the manually transferring pollen all these things and those approaches work but mm -hmm. they are not necessary in the end if you again are willing to accept some chaos yeah yeah oh um, i have one other question with the original vulgarous blue beans as you selected them for blue seeds did any other traits change alongside properties pretty right. much the same um so because we didn't really know the parentage of these of the, of the original hybrid, because it was just a random hybrid in the garden, and it was kind of a guess as to what would happen. Eventually, with talking with the, the bean collector as to what they had been growing the year before, what varieties were there, versus what traits I did see segregating out, we were able to figure out that it was a you know likely parentage between a, a, a yellow bean and a black bean with white spots. Um, and the yellow bean was a bush bean and the black bean was a pole bean. Mm. And in my subsequent generations, I got bush beans and pole beans. That was how I knew that. <laughs> in the subsequent generations, I had some beans turn up with white spots that were black. So I knew that. And so that kind of gave me a better idea about the origin of it. Among the beans that were the targets of selection for the color, in the early generations, every plant had a slightly different shade. Some were a bit more purple, some were a bit more gray. And so... Uh, that in the early years, I was very much, sit, uh, I, when I could, I grew them on separate trellises and isolated the beans per plant and then, you know, did a fine perceptual analysis, just looking at them to see which one was more the color I was looking for. In following generations, when I wanted to grow more plants and didn't have enough trellises, I just grew them all together and then I would look at them by individual pod. But at, at, at that point, the color had become more stable. In my bush bean line, it's entirely stable. In my pole bean line, there's still some recessives that lead to a brown color, which is annoying, but that's you know how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are approaches to more quickly filter out recessives like that, but that requires more trellises, more time, more staff that I don't have available this time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for now, I'm accepting of a low level recessive, you know, tan trait in amongst the seeds. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. So. Next species that you've worked on, because there's a few to, to go through. Uh, the big ones. So the beans, the, what actually first got me started with breeding was tomatoes. And like I said earlier, so miniature tomatoes. And so I've got several miniature tomato lines in different colors. Um, plants grow about, you know, a foot tall and max. They're really happy. And I've got a line that's red, a line that's yellow, a line that's um, orange. Along the way, I got a number of dwarf lines that grow to maybe two feet without support. And the fruit color there varies from white to yellow to orange to red. Um, this last year I had some that had really, the fruit size was, you know, decent size, but the just amount of fruit from the plant was surprising to me. So I'm very happy with that. And looking forward to this year. I've got a few lines that are full size, indeterminate, you know, need trellises, all that. And in that category, I've got a, oh, large cherry, inch and a half around white, one that has kind of my, that's my primary production tomato. I've got a beefsteak, you know, it's pretty, pretty, fairly good size with some giants every now and again, that is 
striped. And so you cut, you cut into it and it's yellow and red and pink and very pretty. And I really look forward to having those fruit every year because they, they, they have a very low seed volume for the fruit mass. Mm -hmm. There are some beefsteak tomatoes, but you cut them open, they're just, they just bleed out because there's so much gel, gel and liquid. These ones, it's mostly just the solid meat, which makes it great for slicing on a pizza or something where it stands up to cooking really well. It's kind of awkward for seed production because there's very few seeds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so trying to scale up seed production is a, a bit of a process. And then I've got another one, which early on, I started calling it lemonade because one of the plants, one of the parent, parent plants in the line had fruit that reminded me of a very good lemonade. The fruit was very sweet and very tart at the same time. And in subsequent years, that flavor has never reoccurred. <laughs> I've come to realize how significantly tomato flavor can be impacted by soil conditions. And so that particular garden in that particular time frame had the right soil to do what, this perfect thing. And I haven't been able to find it since, but I'm working on it. <laughs> if you're looking at introducing more diverse flavors in your tomatoes, Joseph Lofthouse's promiscuous line yes. has <laughs> just every flavor you can imagine in, in various combinations. Uh, that has piqued my interest. And I'm with my limited gardening space, it would be very hard to keep anything as a, as a distinct type if I grew those as well. Yeah. So it's been, been kind of hesitant. If I had more space, I would definitely have some of those though. You might need to wait for someone else to stabilize a particular flavor and then know that you actually want it spreading through the population. I think the primary concept of his plant lines is that you can't stabilize them. So yeah. Oh, you could bottleneck them. I'm sure you could. You bottleneck can bottleneck them. them. You can, yeah. yeah. But but they are. If you have anything else growing, any other tomato growing nearby, it's gonna cross in really fa really fast, and which is great for producing interesting diversity and flavors and all that. But it's it's different if you're trying to produce some types that you can maybe share maybe share later as a hey, this is what you should expect sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that both approaches have a lot of value, though. Other, Any other, other insights crops. with the tomato breeding? Because that sounds like the one you've been doing the longest. I guess it is. It is almost every plant produces tomatoes that are of worth to to use, even if they don't, even if the flavor isn't like the supreme that you're looking for, they're still great in soups and stews. So there's basically no cost from a home grower to just try growing random cross tomatoes mm -hmm. only very rarely have i had a tomato plant turn up that had fruit that i just didn't want to touch anymore like maybe twice total uh, how did how did you source your starting genetics for your tomatoes anywhere and everywhere i could get seeds and I, you can, do you continually introduce more genetics or have you pretty oh, much got what you want i, now? I slow down if, if there's a if i'm looking for a specific trait i will go and try to find it but at the beginning i was saving seeds from everywhere. I saved seeds from a cherry tomato in a salad I got someplace. I <laughs> saved seeds from a McDonald's hamburger. It was just wherever. You can start by buying seeds, but I, I didn't know how this was going to go. I didn't want to invest a lot of money in it. And so I was just like, hey, there's a seed. I'll grow it. That is such good advice that like a, a lot of the food that you buy in the shop has viable seeds in it. And there, there is, there, there are, there are, Differences from what you might expect from, you know, most homegrown types because they have been bred for industrial production. Mm. Uh, a lot of the tomatoes, like the McDonald's tomato, it's a great, to great tomato for its purpose. Mm. It has a mutation called RIN, ripening inhibitor. And what that does is it prevents the fruit from ripening on the field. So they can get these green looking fruit with a little bit of blush. And that's as far as it goes in the field. And they can mechanically harvest it, ship it, store it, all that. And then when they want it to mature, they expose it to ethylene gas, which is just what bananas produce. That's totally natural. Hmm. But it means there's these multiple steps you'd have to do to get a nice ripe red tomato out of it. And so if you do use that genetics, you may get some fruit that does not correspond with what you think tomato fruit would be. Hmm. And so there are situations like that that can happen from using grocery store seeds. But most crops don't have that. If you want to grow melons, Get some seeds from the cantaloupe at the store, or the must, or the what the, what's that green melon, honeydew melon, hmm. you know, and those those grow out wonderfully. In fact, those when you grow from melon seeds from the store, the melons that you can get can be so much better than you'll get from the fruit in the store, because the fruit in the store have to be again have to be picked early, and so they're not fully mature and fully sweet and all that. Hmm. But the ones you mature at home, you can let them go until they're done, and then it's a wholly different experience. Hmm. And yeah, there's a lot of people who have the idea that you can't save seeds from the store because they're sterile, because they're hybrids, all that. And for the most part, none of that matters. They're, they're viable seeds. They will produce something that will be worthwhile. It might not be exactly what you purchased in the store, mm. but for me, that's fine. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's just more diversity to throw into the mix because you're going to have to select off types as part yeah. of the process. So yeah. It's... And, you know, in the end, you may decide that one works really well for me. I had a melon line that was going for a few years and I ended up selecting out this tiny little melon that was just syrupy sweet and aromatic and wonderful. And when I moved at one point, I lost the seeds. So I have that line's gone. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm frustrated about that. In my current growing conditions, I haven't been able to grow any melons because just the, the soil isn't right. Or I had one nice looking melon and went to harvest it and it was hollow because mouse got into it. And <laughs> uh, yeah. do you, do you have a, a system for backing up your seed storage now in case of disasters? I, I do have a better seed storage system than I used to. I have seeds dry dried seeds in plastic vials. There's some air exchange because it's not a perfect seal, but it's, but it's still, you know, keeps them isolated. A lot of seeds I have in just in paper envelopes. Uh, again, so they, there's no risk of them getting moldy because the humidity here isn't a, isn't a problem. Mm -hmm. And any humidity that's left in seeds will be able to dry out. And I've got a root cellar where I can keep things relatively cool for most of the year. And so I can keep the seeds there. I'm not generally terribly worried about the germination rate of the seeds I keep because if I've got 300 seeds and I have a 10% germination rate, then I've got what I need. Yeah. But if you're selling seeds or if you get a seed packet and you get 10% germination, there was a problem. Or if you're a farmer and you buy seeds and you have 10%, there's a problem. There's a um, big problem. Yeah. They'll yeah, be suing yeah. you for all of their wasted time and, and energy. Absolutely. But for, for my purposes, I try to save an excess of seeds that I need because I know that I, you know, even if they're getting older and losing viability, I was still at something. Mm. I saved uh, a set of pepper seeds when I was in 18 years old in high school. This was in, I was in San Antonio, Texas, and we had some nice serrano chili plants. So I saved a bunch of seeds. And the last germination test on those where I had viable plants coming out was 23 years later, something. And so these were just stored in a jar with the dried chilies that I had been keeping with me as I moved from place to place. I had in the kitchen, I used some of the pods and food and the and the seeds that fell down the bottom, I, I just left there and I was able to get viable growth out of this. It might've been 1% or whatever, but I was able to get plants to grow, grow on from that. Mm -hmm. However, because those seeds were saved in South Texas where the plants did wonderfully, up here, they did not do very well at all. So it was fun and it was kind of neat to have this, save the seeds along the way, but uh, they were not adapted to my area. And so I do not have not continued to grow them here. <laughs> my philosophy definitely is that the safest place to store seeds is in other people's gardens. That will definitely prevent scenarios where a cow comes through and eats your garden or you have a, a pest and it gets wiped out. I don't have that much sort of physical redundancy from site to site, but with the number of seeds I store, I do not plant everything year to year. And so I have backups from at least, you know, one or two time steps in the past yeah. that also gives me that redundancy. I was sure there was a third, at least one third crop oh, that you're working oh, on. Oh, there's several. Oh. There's peppers. <laughs> let's keep um, going. Let's keep going. There's peppers. Let's see. Peppers, potatoes, eggplant, tomatillos. Let's talk about tomatillos. Tomatillos are very aggressive outbreeders. And so if you want to make a hybrid between those two, you just take the two varieties, grow them right, right next to each other, and you've got hybrid seed. Along the way, I found some of my tomatillos stored very well in the in storage. I've had fruit sitting on the kitchen in a bowl, just sitting there for a year and a half. Wow. And, and the fruit did not go soft. It did dry out a little bit, but it didn't desiccate. And then I could save seeds and grow on from there. But it turns out that that trait is a dominant trait and so in the next generation, I had a bunch of plants where they had the recessive trait come back and the fruit decayed away just as rapidly as like any tomato would. And so I've been trying to stabilize that variety to get the longer storage trait. And that is difficult because stabilizing a dominant trait means you have to exclude the hidden recessives, which takes some luck and some time. Um, so it's basically uh, choose two plants and bottleneck them and, and cross your fingers that they're both there is some of that. I have different seeds from that I saved from different plants. And one year I grew from one plant and had a bunch of the recessives come up. Okay, that not a good plant for this. One year I grew a plant and had none of the recessives turn up. So maybe that just had the dominant traits. Those ones were all green and I want to get a purple. So I set those seeds aside and then tried again from the purple ones. 
And in this last generation, the fruit I've, I've had, some of it lasted really well and some of it didn't. I've got one tomatillo sitting in my kitchen just sitting there uh, right now. And so maybe that'll work. This year, maybe I'll grow from that one. Maybe I'll grow from the green ones that I've already gotten the recessive weeded out. I'm not sure. I remember trying a tomato variety that was supposed to be a storage type called Vesuvius. Right. That they, they hang I've, it up. I've in heard about that one. It and didn't store for me under my humid, warm conditions. Yes, that one is the. It partly depends on the how you treat the plant, how you store the fruit, the environmental humidity conditions, the light conditions, and the soil conditions. Yeah. Seems to play a part in that. Yeah, um, and the, the volcanoes that are beside me are like fifty million years old, so a little bit different. <laughs> that yeah, probably has um, an effect too. I definitely thought about getting seeds from that, and I think there's one other variety which is characterize as in that way and trying to grow it but i'm not sure it'll work in my in my environment it would be nice to have some storage tomatoes so i can you know not have to can everything up immediately or dry everything immediately but i don't have those yet my potatoes um most of the potatoes that are grown in the u.s and presumably other places where europeans have colonized the world are tetraploid and they were their history they came from the peruvian andes and went to europe and then went to elsewhere and along the way, the tetraploid types became dominant. The ones I grow are diploid, and they don't have in their ancestry having gone through Europe. Their, their, the seed has been more directly derived from Peru and then grown more isolated. And typically the diploid potatoes have smaller fruits, sorry, smaller tubers than the tetraploid types. They have lumpier ones, they have more colors. And my interest in using those is more because I can actually make some predictions about the genetics because the diploid is a lot simpler than touch point. Yeah. I've got a, a few, I guess, varieties now from that project. It does take a few years to see what they're going to do because potato seeds are these tiniest, tiny, tiny little things. And in that first year you get a plant and you get some tubers, but it had to start from next to nothing. Mm. And then in the next year, they start from the small tubers and you get bigger tubers. And it might take even a third year before they really can show what they're up to. That said, one of my diploid varieties produces tubers that are larger than the tetraploid that I grew in comparison with it this this last year. I didn't necessarily grow the biggest tetraploid. It was just when I could get that was easy enough. It was a German butter ball, which produces, you know, nice, good size uh, tubers. And one of my diploids had tubers that were larger than that. And all of the two tubers I have at this point, all the diploid lines have a good, you know, nice flavor that you would expect from normal potatoes. But earlier on, I got some really wild flavors coming out of it. There's one plant that I wish I had saved for prank use only. <laughs> the tubers tasted like a fresh cut lawn of green grass. <laughs> and at that moment, I was like, yeah, nope, that's going away. But <laughs> the next year and later, I was like, you know, I should have saved that. <laughs> um, did did you source any of your diploids from Bill Whitson? Yes, absolutely. That mm. was my source from Bill Whitson of cultivariable.com. He is uh, a anytime national someone treasure. Did, Absolutely. Anytime anyone expresses interest in tubers, I push them his direction because that is the support of his business that I can give. And I think his work is very valuable. I know of at least one other person who has ordered seeds from there and grown their own potato varieties and was very pleased. I don't know what became of them after that, but it's, it's nice to see people doing that. Did you end up doing any interspecies eggplant or Capsicum hybrids, any, any chili hybrids? Sort of. I, I'll get there. The eggplant that I've been working with is the scarlet eggplant. Okay. I'm not even sure how to pronounce that name. Is okay. it eth ethopicum or something? Yes. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it because I've only ever seen it written. And that mm. took me a moment, but yes, that's the one. Yeah. And I started with two varieties. One was, it's still commercially as Turkish red. It's about, you know, yay big. Nice scarlet color with some green stripes. And then I got a second variety from a local Hmong farmer at, at a farmer's market where I was just chatting with him about his crop. And then after, after we were chatting with the, about what the eggplants were and whatever, he's like, here, have this. I was like, oh, a gift. He's like, oh, oh, thank you. And that one has tiny, tiny fruit that is forms in lovely chains. They have a much more bitter flavor than is conventional for American taste. And so I grew them right next to each other. And some of the seedlings turned out hybrid mm -hmm. and went from there. In the F2 or F3 generation, I ended up with one plant that came up that had white fruit instead of instead of green when they're immature. They still ripened to this lovely scarlet in the end, but they, the white fruit kind of stood out to me. And so I decided to go that direction. This is not the only white 
when unripe version variety of the species around, but uh, that trait was not something I was expecting. So that's what I went with. Mm. And my cat is taking more space. And that one, I, I grow a few plants every year and I put them into stews and whatnot. And, you know, it's kind of a nice thing. Not a, it's not a interspecies hybrid, but it's just a different species than most people are thinking about for eggplants. Mm. Now, with peppers, most of my seed stock is mostly capsicum annum. Some of the plants I grow are a wild pepper from the desert southwest of the US, which is uh, Latin known as capsicum annum var glabriusculum. It's a little tiny bird pepper, exceedingly hot, and I ended up with a cross of that and a more typical garden pepper. I don't know what the other parent was, but it didn't matter to me, and I've got several plants derived from that. Some of my lines ha have crossed in with a pepper that's called pimenta danaid, which is described as being an anum and caps and um, chinensis cross. I'm not sure anyone's really done the genetic analysis to be sure, but it is has a crazy hot pod and thin fruit wall, which is definitely more consistent with chinensis types. And between those two and a sweet bell pepper, I've got a lot of diversity coming out of this part of the population. At some point, I got a plant that had pods that looked like a jalapeno, but the plant was much more productive than any jalapeno I'd grown here. I had a plant that had pods that were very much like a habanero, but again, the plant was much more productive than any habanero that I'd grown here. So I decided I was going to make my own jalapeno and my own habanero and save seeds from those. And at this point, I don't know what the garden's going to be. Um, but in this last generation, I had some exceedingly hot pepper plants and some perfectly sweet ones. I can send you a photo of that collection of peppers if you want to use that as a splash screen. Oh, for, yes. Amazing. You know, for, yes, purposes. absolutely. Um, you, you've inspired me because we have a wild capsicum annum frutescens, the big shrubby one. Right. It grows wild here. It just comes up in the goat paddocks. And when they yes. grow in the vegetable garden, you get a much more productive plant out of them. But every other capsicum I've tried has been difficult. Like I'll get a bit out of it for the amount of effort that goes into getting them going and keeping them yes. alive. It's not really worth uh, the, it. So one day I've got to hybridize some of those better, thicker uh, the walls, wild, less The wild genetics varieties. definitely has advantage of, it has not been coddled, it has not been babied along. And so it's potentially gonna have more resistance factors to disease mm. and soil conditions and whatnot. Mm. Frutessens doesn't cross as well to the anum and chinensis types. But I think it can. I would yeah, have to look I'm, at that I'm expecting to have uh, to do it by hand to at least get the first dozen seeds to get it off the ground. Yeah, there's there's some of the crosses that work in a technical sense that you can do embryo rescue on the seeds and do some sort of lab, lab techniques to get something out of it. And protestants may be one that it may be it may require that, or it may require the pollination to go only one direction and not yeah. the other. I'm not sure of that part. Um, I won't be doing tissue culture lab embryo right. rescue, but I will be throwing pollen in every direction that it can right. go. Mm -hmm. Trying multiple varieties of annuum because there's a good chance that some of them are more compatible than others. Absolutely. I know that getting seeds there from anywhere else is difficult because of the biocontrol you know, standards you have, which is perfectly fitting. But if you find you can get seeds from a variety called patine or tepine or bird pepper, then those would have a lot more of that wild genetics that you could maybe use in that scenario. Yeah, it's it's on my to-do list. It's a it's a long to-do list. <laughs> yes. Let's see. We're actually coming up pretty close to the end of the hour. I think we, that's fine. We can always I can we'll, just keep we'll talking about those another, things. We'll get you back next year. You'll probably have new all new results to talk about. Um, that so would we've be fun. got we've got a few kind of broader questions to round things off in the end. So if you had like a magic wand and you could breed any kind of plant that you wanted, what would you, what would you wish into existence? Oh, fruit trees would be wonderful, but they take so long. There's one particular sort of project I've had for several years, and that is to domesticate some of the wild solanums we have around here. We have wild solanum nigrum, little black nightshade that a lot of people around here refer to as deadly nightshade, even though that is an entirely different species. Hmm. And the black nightshades, the fruit are generally edible, but sometimes they have an excess of solanine. Yeah. And so it's not something it's not something you just want to go go wild about. Hmm. But every time I come across some plants, I take a berry and taste it and maybe save some seeds and maybe grow them. And, and at one point have, I found a plant. You have the huckleberry strains in the US as well too? Like the, the more those ones are available, but ones? I, 
those ones are available, but I haven't really grown them because mm. I the wild plants are more intriguing to me for their disease resistance and whatnot. Mm. I did find one wild plant that had fruit that were about twice the volume of the normal fruit. I was like, cool, that's great. Uh, I popped one off, put it in my mouth, spat it out immediately because it had a crazy amount of solanine. So I was like, <laughs> okay, not that one. There may be a correlation between excess growth and excess solanine, but I don't know. This is more of a just a project that I think would be really cool uh, as it goes and it, no real progress on it, but it'd be kind of neat too. So well, I think it, that's it, my, that's a good example for one, that, that You question. only need one lucky cross between the right varieties and, and you've done yep. most of the work. So what's your vision for the future of food in your community? Kind of one of my big concepts is the only people who have a say in what the, the plants we grow become is those who are involved in breeding them. Uh, if you rely on industrial players to, to produce your seeds, all you're going to get is industrial varieties that are have the motivations and traits that industrial growers want. That might be fine, but it won't have your input into it. And so if you want, I used to have a better phrase for what I can't think of right now. If you want to have your, your motivations, your guidelines, your history into the plants, you need to be involved in plant breeding. That said, it's very easy to get involved at that level. If you're saving seeds, if you grow something in the garden, that's step one. If you save seeds to grow the next year, that's step two through infinity. That's it. Everything beyond that is for technical or genetics or, or whatever. That's just that's cool, but it's not necessary to have your your place being as part of the, his, the, the future history of these plants. Now, how do you hope to pass on your work to future generations? I don't know that part yet. There's some varieties that I, I would like to eventually have produced at a scale for general distribution. I had this kind of idle amusement of, hey, it'd be really cool if I could get blue beans for sale in grocery stores. And, you know, and there's steps and steps beyond where I'm at to get to that point. But I've got, you know, some contacts with people talking about, you know, what's involved and IP protection that's sufficient to do that. And, yeah. you know, and so that's something I'm working towards. So maybe one day there'll be blue dry beans at the grocery store somewhere. I don't know. Amazing. Uh, now, what is your final message to people who are thinking of getting into crop breeding? You do not have to know anything about the plants or genetics or all this educationally interesting stuff to start. Uh, the blue beans I mentioned are a good example of that. I had no idea that it would be possible. I did no idea of the biology. I just thought, hey, that'd be cool. And along the way, because it was something I was interested in, I learned more about it and learned more details and maybe now have a better strategy. Uh, but all you have to do is start. And that's the that. Oh, and final chance to uh, plug, how can people get in contact with you or read more about your work? I have a blog, which we can share a link to. That's the biologist is in at dot blogspot.com. I have social media accounts at various, basically any place that I've come across. I think six different accounts where I cross post discussions and content under the name at the biologist is in. N, not in, because I ran out of characters. <laughs> and again, I can give you that in text form so we can make I'll, sure it I'll gets I'll post all those links to in people. the description. And yeah, you know, people every now and again, you know, they respond to some post I have and they say, oh, I've got this cool thing in the garden. What do you think? And it's kind of nice to just have just conversations about genetics and, you know, plant breeding and plant growing with random people. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to, my, talk to our audience and to me. And it's been absolutely inspirational. And I hope we get a chance to talk again in another year or two. I will. Every year I have something interesting. So yeah, I would look forward to that. Brilliant.